Welcome, yogis. We're going to tune in, tap in, close your eyes. And take a moment to drop into your breathing. And call this the yogic breath, where you fill up from the lowest part of your lungs. So we access that by deepening the belly to the waistline, to the upper lungs. And then the slow, steady exhale, breath out from the upper lungs down and all the way down and towards your belly. So the diaphragm is expanding and contracting as we breathe. And then take a moment, just take notice of how you've arrived, wherever you're, you are in listening. And take notice how your physical body feels. And then I'll have you take a nice full deep breath in, part your lips and offer a sigh out. And we'll open with an om and wherever you're listening, if you are able to, you can join in if you like. And we'll do we'll do one pranava today. So just one om to drop into this beautiful art and science of yoga, the magic behind it, the discussion that has been uh, talked about for thousands of years. And for Om, take an inhale. Ooh, om. This is the Daily Practice Podcast with Crystal Borelli and Andrea Hellman. Hariyum. Hariyum. This is my favorite part of the week. I feel oh, like. that's cute. Yeah. Well, I think it's because I, I always feel super overwhelmed over doing it. And then we come here, airplane mode. Airplane uh, mode. And then I think after like listening to it and exporting it, then I remember it. And then I kind of think about it for a few days. And that actually like integrate it, you know, because sometimes I feel like when you're in a yoga class or something, everything makes sense. But then when you go home, you kind of like lose a little bit in transport. Whereas having this, I'm like transported back to it. And I like going back and like re-listening. Well, that's great. That's also what the um, daily practice is about. But the also like the sadhana, which is the daily practice of yoga. So that continuous uh, reminders and check-ins and those little rituals that really keep you uh, present or remind you, you know, all those things. So that's a really important part mm-hmm. of the yoga practice is the daily sadhana. What do you, how do you wake up, Crystal? <laughs> <laughs> I quickly went to my husband. He calls me a slug yeah, because I don't like to wake up. <laughs> you creep into your day. <laughs> yeah. If I had choice, I don't set an alarm and I just like to wake up naturally. But I've been pretty tired lately. I've just been having um, lots of just completing of projects, which is awesome. But um, I think that the overworked mind and then taking on a lot, I think a lot of us can do that. We take on a lot. And um, yeah, I I would like to get better at learning, not learning because I do know, but better at conserving my energy. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. I find that I deplete it quite easily and I uh, don't re- replenish. Mm. But also with that said, I just want to add one more thing to this. Yeah. I find that my time out or stepping away from, I mean, really lately it's been the computer because I've, over the last you know three years, I wrote a book. I wrote a teacher training manual. I basically wrote two books. So I've been at my computer and this creating this program, which is amazing. But my time out of stepping away is like, and doing yoga practices and teaching yoga. But my time for myself is going dirt biking, which is so physically hard on your body, uh, which is amazing. But I, then I find I'm just as just tired and I get up and do it all over again. Mm -hmm, For sure. I feel like I wake up and then I, if I don't do something right away, that's physical. Like my days are just ruled by everything else. And then it'll be like late at night and I don't even know what happened. And I don't feel in control of my days as of late. Yeah. Like Mike, he likes to get up and he'll go right to the gym. I get up and I have my ritual. I don't like to have text messages in the morning. Like people message me before nine and I'm like, why the fuck are you messaging before nine? (laughs) But but do you go on Instagram? 
once in a while, but my routine is like, that's my choice going out into it where people are like, why? Like, I feel there's always this pressure when someone messages you that you have to respond right away. I mean, I'm creating that own pressure on myself, but so my ritual is getting up and making my coffee or my tea. And while that's happening, I usually, um, I go in and out of this, but this is one of my favorites as I do, um, now Kriya. So the, snapping your belly in and then pulling it in. And then I do the, the movement of the, um, the, the rectus abdominis, the movement of your body. And where do you belly. do it? Where do you do it in your house? In my bedroom. Okay. But like, so you stand up and then you do it. Yeah. I stand with like my hands and my thighs. So I just finally got this practice. Um, I've been doing like Agni Sara, sorry, Agni Prasanna, Agni Sara. Yep. That's what it is. Is Agni Sara. Um, the belly snapping in for a long time. And I've always tried to figure out how to get the Nauli, which is when the muscles like ripple. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I just finally figured it out. And so I'm kind of obsessed to mm -hmm. be honest with you. I love it. And a uh, great way for the internal organs. But then with that, and then I'm like, let's have coffee. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Okay. I've been reading this book called Breathe by James something. He was actually just, or not just on, but in December he was on Russell Brand's podcast. Oh, I love him. Shout out Russell. Yeah. And it's all about breathing and how as a society we breathe through our mouths and it's like destroying like our physicality and um, deteriorating, you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And, of course. Uh, yeah. And how I think he was saying like culturally, like I think it's like North Americans and maybe like Europeans and stuff, like we're heavy mouth breathers and other cultures in the world um, like just know to, to stay focused on like the nasal. Mm. Uh, and chest breathing too. Like have you noticed a lot of ba babies, they breathe big belly breaths that's what we're supposed to do as well. Gets the richest oxy oxygen down there. And, um, but I think like, I don't think about, I think about, um, like size, size are so important. They soften your nervous system. Mm. They relax you. Yeah. Ooh. And then add like a hum even better. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I sigh a lot cause it, 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 um, uh, de-stresses you. Yeah. So I don't know when you were growing up, but when I was growing up, they did, um, physical testing. And so you used to have to like bring your heart rate up super fast and then like bring it down and they tested it in both like to see where you're at. And I remember a kid, I don't remember what grade it was, but he said, when you go to like your peak, like once you raise it, he's like yawn. And then when they test it, like it just brings you right down. So I've, I've had that trick since like grade five, but never known why. Interesting. Ah. Uh. I find for a while there when I was practicing uh, strong power yoga, like power vinyasa, uh, I would, in class, I would actually start yawning a lot. Not because I was bored. I just, <laughs> but I think it's an, it's an oxygen thing, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Apparently. Well, that's the other thing that his research in, in Bree says. It, it's um, breathing through the nose, but it's also about not breathing too much and, and breathing like really like slowly. And it's like the exchange of carbon dioxide and... I have a really cool fact. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to share it with you. Hit us. This is dope. So Krishmacharya, who's considered to be the grandfather, I always say godfather. I'm like, wait, no, this isn't some gangster shit. He's the grandfather of yoga. He basically took a lot of the teachings and um, made it accessible for like the yoga that we practice now. More of like, you know, he did the Hatha yoga, but he taught potentially. He brought the bridge. Sorry, not potential. Yeah, he did the bridge. He brought he taught uh, Patabi Joyce and Iyengar and Ashtanga and all of that. But what he did to get people interested in yoga and especially these like kings and maharishis and he would go and he would do different practices. One was um, the acrobatic style of it, like con basically like kind of contortionist, you know, have, and especially have little kids like because they're so bendy, but they would do some really cool asana poses um, to get people intrigued. But the other thing that he did is that he was able to slow his heart rate down to almost undetectable because of his breathing techniques. And people were in awe of that. It kind of like reminds me of like the circus, like, oh my God, like he can stop his heart, you know? It was like that, but it was through his breathing practices and his ability to slow and shift his prana that uh, really intrigued and what got yoga popular back then to like go out through India and mm. perform or, or to, you know, to show people. Mm -hmm. the power behind it so i think that's really cool it started with the breath yeah what's your other favorite guy is shwarmy because <laughs> <laughs> i think what <laughs> i think 
<laughs> Isn't it something shwar- shwarm? Well, Swami is the word you're looking for. Yeah. Okay. Well, say, say his name then. Well, I don't know who you mean. Oh, yeah, because there's a few of them. There's, there's <laughs> many. <laughs> is there a top Is there a top uh, breathing of uh, the Swami people? Swami. <laughs> Um, I would say there's a top. I mean, like, there's so many. It depends on what lineage you're looking at. Like for yoga meditation, like Swami Satyananda or like um, Swami Yogananda, who is like my my 103. He lived like 106. That guy yeah. that was like, you. He drank. He ate prana prana for food. That guy. I bet it's that guy because he references him in the book. I'm gonna have to like go back and read it. Okay. But it's like something like with his hand that he can change like the temperature in his hand and the way it moves like from his breath. I don't doubt it. Well, even um, Yogananda, who is my my great aunt. Um, her teacher, Yogananda, was the first spiritual um, teacher to come over from India, and she created a, um, like a whole fellowship center for him in Hollywood. But when he died, it was said that he his body was preserved and sat as in like nobody. He like basically died in samadhi. Like he went into enlightenment and his body stayed in its natural form without decaying or anything for like 29 days or something. Like it was something miraculous. Yeah. Ah, oh, I should Pretty look. sure it was him. I should look in my book, the Tibetan book of living and dying, because they say like after your spirit passes, like you should leave. Maybe it's like seven days. It- yeah, I think a lot of um, cultures have that. Mm-hmm. It's actually cool because talking about prana, nice little introduction there, Andrea. Because talking. <laughs> well, I think this is the whole conversation. <laughs> right. Yeah. How did that happen? Anyway, so in within the prana, so the vital life force, there's actually said to be five pranas. They're the they're called the vayus, and they're winds of our breath. And so it's the way that the movement of energy flows through our system. So there's prana vayu that comes from like above and comes down around the heart center and then back up and the lungs and whatnot. And that's considered to be like the uplifting prana. Then there's a pana vayu, which is the downward flow. And that's from the navel going down. And that's like everything elimination, right? Like think how we go to the washroom, we detox, we release that way. There's, I have a point to this too, what we were just talking about, but saman vayu in the navel center. So when a pana and prana are in function, um, the navel center is flowing. This is saman vayu. And this is like digestion of food, yes, but also digestion of thought. And this is really the focus of the yogi, this area, because it houses the ego, our physical form, but as well as our spiritual form, our spiritual connection to self. So then once those are happening, we have vyan vayu, which is the energy all around us, considered to be like our aura right? Lots of pranayama, your aura and this, um, some, uh, Vyan Vayu, excuse me, can go out to like nine feet, this energy. And when your energy is that amplified, you have the ability to shift energy in the room. So you know how someone walks in the room and, uh, you're like, whoa, like you all, like you feel happy or, you know, or someone comes in the room and they're like really angry (laughs) and they have the ability to shift everything. So that type, and some people have that energy field without knowing it. And some people build up to have that ability. And then the hope is that if you have that ability, that you use it for the greater good, you use it for good intention and to uplift and vibrant, high vibe in everybody, right? Like a little shout out to Rachel Wayne, right? Right now, little Care Bear stare. Remember the Care Bears and they stare? Yeah, those guys. So then we have the one that I'm thinking about that you just brought up was via, um, Udan Vayu. So Udan Vayu comes down from above and it goes into your throat and then it goes back out. And this is the breath, the first breath that you take when you arrive here in physical form, right? You're, you were, mm. you were born and you take a breath in. This is the, the Prana Vayu, the, they're sorry, um, Prana Vayu. Yeah, of course it is. It's Prana, but it's Udan. And this breath, this energy, it stays with you throughout your entire life. And at the time of death, people take their last breath, it releases, that's Udan Vayu leaving your physical body. That's the last breath. Um, when you leave, you're basically your spirit, your energy is being transformed back to where it once become or once it came. And, and so we are this energy, right? Like it, it's, it's part of us. It, it's part of our essence, our soul, our vitality. And a lot of these, um, pranayama, practices is building this awareness and this vitality within our body. Uh, and yeah, and it's not separate from us. Mm-hmm. Rant complete. So good. Well, I think I've shared with you before when I witnessed um, my mother's passing that I saw 
her last breath. And then I saw a crazy ripple across her forehead. And like, I just felt so much peace in my body Mm. as did my sister. And we were both crying. And then as soon as that release happened, we just like our eyes met across from her bed and we both just smiled without a word. And then it felt very calm and peaceful. And I think that's like, you know, when people have a terminal illness and it's like, you're so relieved that they're not in physical pain anymore. Um, and so I've been kind of obsessed with that ever since. And then I was at that time, somebody had given me that book, the Tibetan book of living and dying. And that really like helped me position, um, death and, uh, kind of our role to be like caretakers to people as they're, they're kind of winding down and just like support them to like transition into like their next life. And, you know, Mm -hmm. yeah. So now there's death doulas, which I think, I mean, I say now, but I think they've been around forever. We're just more, it's more, it's come around full circle that it's more common to have them now, which I think is so important. And this, you know, in yoga, like we lay down at the end of practice in Shavasana, the corpse pose, this is the idea of practicing your own death. Like, Mm -hmm. because it's for the most part, it's scary, right? There's fear there. There's fear Mm -hmm. of the unknown. There's fear of letting go of your physical identity of what you created and who you are and the people that you're leaving, right? Of course, it's hard to leave. I think that's the hardest part. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it's this really like um, shedding of identity and self. And um, you can see that when people are leaving their physical body, you can see like parts of them almost fading away. It's mm-hmm. like like in their, what they look like and, you know, um, mm-hmm. things shift of what's important. But the idea, you know, in like in the Shavasana is that you, um, it's the practice of your own death And the last breath is that sigh. But what's happening is to go in, like Shavasana is a beautiful place, right? Like we go and we go into like this blissful place within ourselves and it's building this relationship with the divine or your higher self or this energy that we were just talking about, like continuing to build that connection, you know, like, like within the divine realm, like the vastness of it all. So that when the time comes, we're at more peace. We're like, okay, like it's not the end. It's just this next level of, uh, stepping into, and hopefully we can do it all with as much grace as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think just like finding that peace every day and, you know, I find that that's like hard. Like that's when I feel like my day is ruled by something that's not me is because I don't have enough of those moments of like peace Mm. or like presence. Yeah. And that comes back around to why, um, why, sorry, I got like a little emotional. So I was trying to like not burst into tears. <laughs> so I'm, I got a little lost there for a second. Um, so that's what's so important to tie it around into a daily practice or coming around to your daily sadhana, your spiritual practice, whether that's, you know, whatever it is for you, like walking in the woods or doing some breathing or um, saying some chants or having friends, like human connection, you know, whatever fills you up is like so important because we're here for not a very long time and some um, leave a little earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe our mantra today should be too. Yeah, I have a healing heart mantra. Let's take a deep breath in. Good sigh. All right. So this mantra that came up, and I'm not really, maybe because of sparking of our conversation, or um, I usually share this mantra around when somebody in your life needs energy, needs love, needs healing. Um, it can be even you, if you need, um, some healing, I call it the healing heart mantra. It's, um, it, it reminds me of like a serenade to the soul. It's a Buddhist mantra. And, um, the translation is I've gone, gone, gone beyond to enlightenment. I have gone. And so the, the focus is on the last part, enlightenment, and it's um, the Bodhisvaha. So it's, uh, yeah. So I'll have you close your eyes if you're not driving, <laughs> if you're in a place to close your eyes. 
And it's nice to bring um, someone to your forefront of your mind. Um, see their face, see their smile, see their lightness in their eyes, the sparkle, even if they've passed. So this is to any anyone that's present or needs love or anyone that has passed that you deeply loved. And if they're still here in the healing process or, you know, trying to heal, <laughs> surround them in white light. So you imagine that from the center of your chest, an uh, orb of light glowing and allow the light to grow and glow a little bigger and broader until it encompasses your whole being. And then envision them and surround them with the same light. So they're in a beautiful orb of light. Om Teate Gate Gate Per Gate Per Sam Gate Bodhi Svaha Om Teate Gate Gate Per Gate Per Sam Gate Bodhisvaha Om Teate Gate Gate Per gate, per sam gate, bodhisvaha, um teate, gate, gate, per gate. Per sam gate bodhisvaha 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 the Prajna Paramitra Mantra. Just remember that this energy that we were talking about is around you, but it's also around the ones that have passed. This energy current is always deeply connected, which means we can always reach out and talk to our loved ones. We can always connect and think of them and just know that they, their light is still wrapped around us. I don't even have words. That's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I feel full tangles on like every mm. every particle around my body and every like fiber <laughs> of my body. It's <clears throat> yeah, it's a really beautiful one. The healing heart mantra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It feels like a serenade to the soul, don't you think? A hundred percent. Like when yeah. I when I um, lead it or teach it, I haven't had someone lead it to me, but when. I'm in receiving when I sing and people sing it back to me. That's mm -hmm. how it feels. I'm like, oh, my soul is being uh, filled or I feel like that deep love around it. Yeah, it's a really beautiful one. Mm -hmm. It's really powerful. Yeah. I, think, <laughs> <laughs> I made her speechless, you guys. <laughs> right? Well, because I'm so, I just, I think like life and death and um, it's, I don't know, way more poignant than me than everything else in between. And I just had like such a wild experience like with that and all the different parts of it with like going to hospice and, and then actually just like witnessing it, but not, um, also like I didn't do any research or at that time in my life, I was like really ignorant to what was actually like happening, um, to the body as you go through, um, different forms of, of illness. 
I try always to kind of tell people as many things as possible that I kind of extracted from that experience and like things from, right from when people are um, really suffering and then you feel that relief, but then you feel guilty about the relief that you feel that they're gone, but it's more mm. rooted in them not suffering than in of course. There's just such a while, like a, a myriad of like so many different feelings and they're all really big emotions. And I would love to create something that people like could just sing that <laughs> and, and like, like what you're saying, like the serenade to the soul. And it's kind of like assembling like bits of your heart back mm-hmm. together and fusing it. Yeah. Cause it, death is a, an intense one, obviously that goes without saying. And I, it's part of life. It's part of this living experience, right? Like the moment we're born, we're like working towards our own death and we have to experience that in our life is part of it. You know, like it's, it's all part of it and it's, um, it hurts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think like the way we are, we think that we need to like process it and let it go and then it's not going to affect us. And then a friend of mine who lost her partner, drew this like beautiful painting a few weeks ago and in the center of the painting was like this black um dark sort of like rock and then she painted all of these rainbow colors almost like auras around it Mm. and was just saying how like loss never really leaves your body but you do wrap yourself around like these these other energetic forces and stuff um you know and and that's kind of how I feel like it doesn't like the edges soften but it doesn't really go away but then you also are able to connect to people in such a a, a deeper way I don't know it's it's a wild ride and um definitely I think talking about it and embracing it a little bit more in our culture and not being so scared of it I think would be uh beneficial to everybody that is either like facing it in their own like future or if they're like supporting a a loved one Mm mm-hmm I don't know. Feet, our friend Feet yeah. t- tells me I'm like, he's like, you kind of talk about death a lot, Andrea, uh, uh, on your podcast. It always comes up. <laughs> I'm like, well, it's kind of, it's, it's one of like, you know, <laughs> it's happening at some point. It is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's all right. That's good. I mean, as you said, like more awareness to it, it's part of the cycle. It's part of, and we experience little deaths all the time. We sometimes we don't recognize it as that, but we are in that constant ebb and flow of, you know, births and sustaining and then, you know, these little deaths and like leaving a job or like a breakup. It, it, it's like how you, it's like a morning, right? Like it, it feels similar where it's a part of yourself of an energy exchange you've had for a while. And then it's an ending of the cycle. I always think of like death to the ego. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they do say that, um, you know, the old teachings, right? Where like in the yogis and whatnot, they wanted to like kill the ego. So the renunciates, they would let go of everything, attachments of every kind so that they could completely let go of the material, which is the connection like to the family and the job and the clothing and all this stuff to try to end the ego. But the thing with that is that, you know, these guys would go out and, you know, the cave dwellers and stuff. And if you let go of everything, your, all of your attachments, then yeah, the ego dies, but then you die too. So now it's using this new modern day idea is that I'm a householder. I love, um, food. I love family. I love um, my dirt bike. I love yoga. I love, um, living in this experience. And so that is all part of the ego, right? Putting on these different masks and shapes and forms and whatnot. And, um, so we're trying to use the wisdom of our ego and then it's called the Jiva Mukta or Jiva Mukti is that you bring down the enlightened part of yourself or the spirit or this higher self, which yeah, spirit, and you integrate it into this moment. So we're enlightened in human form. So we keep the wisdom of the ego to stay embodied. And then our spirit gets to have all of the soul gets to have all of this experience. We get to taste chocolate, which I did have before I came over here. I brushed my teeth and I ate chocolate on my way out. (laughs) So we get to enjoy the, the splendors of why we're here, right? So, I mean, you could do death to the ego, but then you're going to leave your physical body. Well, I think it's like those cycles, like what I'm saying about grief is it never really fully leaves you, but it uh, it doesn't pull you down or into like the depths of like attached to like depression or things because a lot of the stuff you have processed, but Mm -hmm. hopefully, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Um, Okay. That was a wild tangent, right? I love it. That was a wild one. (laughs) This is the Daily Practice Podcast with... 
Crystal Borelli. And Andrea Hellman. Yeah, life teachings, life practices. Good luck. (laughs) (laughs) Om Hari Om Hari Om Hari Om If you want to check us out on the World Wide Web, our website is thedailypractice.life. And on there, we have all kinds of resources, but we have a free full moon course. It's about an hour long. There's a yoga practice, pranayama. You'll learn a mantra as well as story time and all taught by Crystal Borelli. Hurry on.